about 40 slides in 45 minutes, so we're going to work fast, so hope you follow me. This is an advanced talk, and I'm going to try to cover quite a lot. Um, if you have any questions you would like to ask, you can do it on the Twitter tag there, or you can send an email. My email will come at the end, and I try to answer, because we may not have time to answer a lot of things during the seminar. Um, why does this um, talk come up under outsourcing? Well, um, the philosophical ch challenges between Agile and ISO or CMM may be more pronounced when we're working in India here, where we have companies who are uh, certified locally here, and we're working with customers abroad, and we may have challenges, additional challenges due to that. Um, but otherwise, the problems are generic. Uh, very quickly about me, uh, I came to India 20 years back. I worked 34 years, I think, with IT. I started when I was in higher secondary, and I've been in it ever since. I'm Swedish, uh, and I've lived here as, for 20 years. I can't speak much. My children laugh at me when I try to speak Tamil, but, uh, because I live in Chennai, but my children speak fluent Tamil, so, and my wife understands much better than me. Um, I don't know what I should say. We have, we are, I work with an ISO certified companies, my own company mainly, but my, some of my Indian staff are also shareholders. Um, I have no personal direct experience of CMM, even though I will say a few things about it. We've outsourced to companies who are CMM companies. I have extensive experience of ISO, extensive experience of Scrum and XP, um, and I worked a lot with requirements before that. Um, we work with development for, uh, in integration services, uh, Tipco and BizTalk, and with various greenfield development, mostly in .NET and mobile. Um, here are some of our customers. Um, you will recognize some of the names. We focus mostly on the Scandinavian market, but also a little bit on the UK market. Uh, but I'm sure you've seen some of these names. Uh, we're working with uh, most of these companies today. Um, okay. I will cover something on about philosophy, and I'm sure that I'm sorry about if that would be th too theoretical. I try to do it very quick and try to cover it. Uh, and then there is a question: if there is a clash or not, and. Uh, we look into a little bit about the uh, Agile Manifesto versus ISO or CMM. Uh, and I've done some research on this. I wrote my master thesis in informatics uh, a few years back. And I looked into the specific problems, quality system as such, but also specifically to Agile. And we look at about what's easy to mitigate and what's hard to mitigate. Um, first a bit on Agile. Um, Agile, you've already history of Agile. Um, Agile has some roots, or some, sometimes you could say these roots are created because I think people put things together a little bit after, afterwards and things have come together. But there are some roots in particular which I think are very interesting. This one with, within social constructionism and the one with complex adaptive systems uh, and lean manufacturing. I think those three in particular are of interest. I'm going to look a bit about social constructionism in particular, constructivism, they are used synonymously. Um, when you look at ISO and CMM, both of them have their roots in the defense industry. Um, ISO is much older in a sense. It was rooted in the British standard during the Second World War and was about creating bombs with uh, good quality so they didn't explode in the factories. Uh, that was redeveloped and with little, put, little finishing where you talked about customer satisfaction in other ways, it's basically the same route. I think in the last standard they even added that we should reduce waste, but it's rarely getting a lot of prominence. Uh, I think uh, the main difference when I look at ISO ticket, which we are working with in our company, is um, getting very similar to CMM. We're getting TIC IT Plus, which is uh, adding maturity levels, and I think they are more or less merging into a similar pattern. Uh, big difference is about how you certify. Uh, ISO, you certify basically any product in the company. I think in CMM, what I understand is that you look at specific products only and uh, uh, appraise those products. Uh, when we outsourced to one company, they said, well, this product will go through appraisal, and they knew that in advance. We never know in advance which product the auditor want to look into. And we also have a lot of internal auditing, so we continuously audit all products internally. Um, 
So is there a clash? Uh, before that, I would like to say, does anyone know what a paradigm is? Anyone studied Thomas Kuhn? Um, a paradigm is a whole worldview. Uh, it's how you see the world. Um, and uh, when it comes to scientific methods, you have an ontology, which means what can you know? What is knowledge? Uh, is a company something real, or is it something we perceive? Uh, that's what is knowledge. Epistemology is how can we know something in the first place at all? Uh, can we know something, and how, t how can we know? And then you have methodology, and you have methods. Um, and agile is a paradigm. Uh, but it's very, it's very closely related to some other scientific paradigms. Uh, I'm sure you heard about positivism. Um, and I'm taking Newton here, because he's one of the uh, main um, person we think of when we think of positivism. Um, you see the rainbow down there. He used first one prism. He took sunlight, took a prism. And then he used a very narrow, uh, what, I don't know what it's called in English, uh, and look at it, and you took another prism. And then he could show that the angle was the same as the one for the color. At the time, people believed that uh, the, the colors, the rainbow, was due to impurities in the prism. They thought white was pure and was undividable. Newton proved it was not, and he did it in a very, uh, very, very proper way. Now, positivism basically believes that we can fully understand the world. We can construct formulas which will construct, describe everything. Um, and it, was, it seemed very good for a number of centuries. Um, and we used the method. You've probably heard it. You put a hypothesis. You do some prediction. And you test it. And you, you use induction to come get a formula which you can reuse. If I drop a stone on my foot, it's going to, probably going to hurt my foot every single time. Um, but uh, maybe it's not so simple. Um, when uh, US um, sent up the first Apollo things to the moon and everything worked very well, and then with Apollo 13, they had a problem. It didn't work. Just because it worked a number of times, it didn't work uh, the next time. Um, Karl Popper is a famous um, philosopher during the last century who um, spoke about that induction, scientific induction doesn't work. Just because something has happened one million times doesn't mean it's going to happen the next time. Just look at the stock market. You can't predict the stock market. Uh, but in, today, most scientists admit that you can't really predict anything, especially when you're talking about quantum physics. You can't totally predict. There is a randomness to it, or you can't know for sure. Waterfall is very much uh, founded on positivism, even though Royce, uh, the American who wrote the first paper, which is normally considered, he's considered the father of, of the waterfall model. Actually, he wrote and said that it's, in his paper, said it's a flawed model, and he suggested feedback loops to avoid this. So he started with this one, but then he suggested something else. But people only remembered this model, so, um, well, he wasn't as bad as people maybe thought, so. Now, quality systems are based on positivist view of requirement, positive view of quality. Uh, they're rooted in the defense industry. They are focused on mass production and repeatable processes. Uh, they focus on quantitative measures of quality. You measure. Um, how many have seen The Matrix? Yes. Um, the Matrix, uh, things were not so easy because you perceived Neo, when he started, he perceived reality as if it was real. And then he realized that, well, which pill do you want? If you take the red pill, uh, no, if you take a, the blue pill, you uh, just wake up next morning, you don't realize anything. If you take the red one, you wake up and realize reality isn't as what you thought it was. Um, now, this idea goes much further back to Plato, which um, showed that what we see of reality is really shadows in a, in a cave, and you have light in between. And you're sitting with the back towards the wall, and you just see the shadows. You don't see the true reality. Now, this thought also exists in uh, most religions, actually. I knew it existed in Hinduism before coming to India, but some Hindu friends of mine told me it exists in Judeo-Christian uh, religions as well. Um, anyone has read uh, in the Bible, it says, vanity, vanity. And that's exactly the same thing. It means that we cannot fully understand the physical reality. We are dependent on our senses to understand it. 
uh, and we can't understand the true nature. Um, now, the Agile Manifesto, what does it have to do with this? Well, uh, it has a lot to do with that, actually, um, and Agile as a whole. And what it says, it's focusing on the individual's interaction, working software, customer collaboration, responding to change. It's not absolute. Now, it's well rooted in traditional engineering, software engineering practices. And we use the same methods to a fairly large extent, but the philosophy is completely different. Quality systems, on the other hand, they stress exactly the things which Agile Manifesto says are not so important. So the, the Agile perspective is based on a subjective worldview, and I will explain it a little more so, soon. Especially requirements which may be seen as socially constructed. That's what we say, we don't truly know. The customer doesn't know fully, we don't fully know, we don't know if we understand the customer correctly. We use user stories, context, other things which are because we recognize we can't fully understand it. It's not possible to, to explicitly describe requirements as was earlier perceived. Um, there's a lot of other things also, and if you have too much documentation, that documentation is explicit. The belief that you can put everything in document is based on positivism. Now, documents are not bad, so don't, don't get me that way. It's just that it's not possible to capture everything in document, and it's easily becoming something for its own sake. Uh, Self-management and self-organized comes basically from complexity theory. Uh, I'm not going to cover that so much, but it's also based on a holistic paradigm, which is different from the positivist paradigm. Uh, I think you know the rest. Uh, there is a slight risk, which I said earlier. We base our agile methodology on uh, traditional methods itself, in, to a large extent. Some are new, but a lot are, are old, or a lot of them are rooted in a positivist practice. So inside the sprint or the iteration, we may ac actually use a fairly rigid positivist approach to some extent, but the bigger picture is different. It's like you are putting a boat in the water, you are pushing it out, you start to row without knowing the direction, and then you adjust the course after, after time. Or like the missile, as we heard this morning. Uh, that's a different paradigm of how to find, find reality. Uh, now, there's a danger if you believe that it is positivist. I claim that. Total quality management is rooted in scientific management and Taylorism, adding statistics, and this is the father of all quality system, basically to a smaller or larger extent. I, so it's not really rooted in total quality management, but it's influenced it. Um, there is research, the little which there is, there's surprisingly little, and it shows that maybe the effectiveness is not given. Um, a lot of the studies which have been done actually don't show it. Both, both those who believe in, the, the researchers who believe in TQM and those who don't actually uh, often in their theoretical assumptions they over-assume the effectiveness of the quality system itself to deliver. Um, and actually, proponents and critics alike pr uh, avoid studies. Um, there's very little, surprisingly little research. I spent a lot of time trying to find proper research about the effectiveness. Most of it is very narrow-minded look, and it's very hard to get a total picture of it. That's true about Agile to some extent also. Most studies about Agile is do done in the university settings with not proper, when they're trying to quantify it. So it is a little hard to know how effective it is. Um, reductionism, rationality, positivism are once again the basis of this. Um, now, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of literature which philosophically question TQM, uh, especially from critical, uh, uh, critical theory. Uh, and the things which are questioned is uh, that there is resistance from staff, uh, there's inconsistency, there's internal politics, which uh, stops it. Uh, a lot of groups are not covered. It's mostly the management's view and customer's view which are taken. Um, I think I covered that. Um, also, it's hard to make research also, because if you ask people who use it, most of the people make their livelihood from it. So if, if I would ask anyone, can I make a critical study or if your quality system is valid, what do you think most quality managers, most auditors, I hope there's no auditor who take offense what I'm saying, but it's hard to, to go in on a study uh, which may show some ineffectiveness of your method. Uh, now, when I interviewed our ISO auditor, uh, I had to tell that he first didn't want to participate, and then I said, 
my interest is to try to get the quality system to work. I'm not trying to find it's bad. I may find some things on the way which is not working, but I'm not interested to, to find faults as such. I'm interested to find how to it work. Then he was happy to collaborate in the study. Um, uh, now, I don't know about CMM, but in ISO, there's a lot of talk, talk about uh, nonconformities. Um, and nonconformities combined with a fairly hierarchical view of how to do it can be dangerous. It can be very high handed. Internal auditors, external auditors can be very high handed. And in addition to that, I remember I visited a customer in Norway, and their quality manager said, well, no company appoint their best people to become quality managers. Uh, that's not saying quality managers are bad, but we don't necessarily put our best people into doing internal audits. Uh, we probably put our best people to deliver to customers, and that's natural. But there's a risk with that, that there would be conflicts for that. That's not a problem in the system itself. It's more a problem how we manage it. Uh, now, there's a problem also with incentives. Often incentives are linked to uh, metrics, and that may also control things. Um, there are more focus on filling in forms rather than customers satisfying customer needs. Uh, there's also politics, as a one which is coming up in a lot of papers is that the quality manager is stressing the internal metrics, the internal things. The pro product manager is stressing delivering to the customer to the extent of compromising on process. There is a built-in uh, conflict here, which may be something we have to live with. So I'm not saying necessarily it's wrong, but I'm saying there is a conflict there. Uh, an auditor is definitely not a proxy for quality control. Uh, it's easy to think just because you have it, they have ISO, you have auditors and all of that, that you get quality because of that. There is nothing like that. There's also a lot of subjectivity built into it. On the surface, it's positivist, but in reality, there is a lot of human thoughts and emotions and views built into it. In experience, when I did a study in my company, I, found, I read through all nonconformities through the years, and I found that a lot of NCs were based on non-understanding by the auditor of the project. Uh, something like 20, 30 percent of the nonconformities were based on that. Uh, and uh, also, the, just because you have processes, it doesn't mean that they are good. So just because you're certified doesn't mean you have good processes. I don't know if you've seen this one. I thought it was fun. Um, now, ISO and quality system typically understand requirements as non-ambiguous description of a system to be developed and it's done in the beginning of the product. If you have an RFP, I'm sure you have to satisfy these requirements, and they are not given. An agile view uh, is that they are socially constructed and depends on the perspective, on the different people would have different views of the system to be created. Uh, and there's a lot of needs. There's political needs, there are emotional needs, there are views which we have because of misunderstandings. A lot of these things comes in, and we construct our view of it. We think we understand what we want to do, but we don't. You know this, but it's, it's, it is a problem. Um, and it's a problem if we perceive it as, uh, as proper and, and explicit. I don't know if you've seen this one. This one was in a textbook when I studied um, IT in Sweden in the 80s. Uh, actually, I, took that, I found the Swedish one, and I translated it into English, that customers said they wanted something. The project leader, inter different people interpret it. Um, Sale described the system in a very luxurious way, as you see, and documentation, forgot, everyone forgot about that. They installed a version which was not complete, and uh, they invoiced a lot, and uh, there was no support, and the customer wanted something else. Um, this, of course, is extreme, but it's telling something about that there are different views of things. There are different views. We see things differently. Um, there are different views of control. Um, Quality systems looks at process to control, management to control, uh, corrective action is mostly from outside, and agile looks at self-managed teams, uh, which is a completely different philosophy. Um, this different view, definition of what is quality. Um, in ISO, it means if you satisfy the, the uh, uh, requirements, you delivered quality. Uh, if the customer afterwards says, well, I wanted it differently, but they had written it that way in their RFP, we would say we have still delivered a quality system. Um, while Agile would say the feedback loop is that we encourage change. We want to understand what the customer really wants, so changes are encouraged. 
Um, if we are selling fixed price product also, we have a problem with change request naturally. Customer would argue, no, that was the way it should be. Uh, while the, with the agile method, if we understand from the beginning and we have an understanding, we partner with the customer, we can get a better understanding of that. But the business models matter also, of course. And there's a conflicting view of process improvements. Um, in ISO, the auditor is a formal, or in a formal audit, he's assessing and judging what is a non-conformity. And I'm, I'm stressing judging. He may have a perception of that, and he may, it's his perception. He hasn't spoken to the customer. He doesn't see the whole picture. I'm not saying what there are, I'm, in nothing of what I'm saying is saying anything what we're doing when we're doing quality system is wrong. I'm just saying it's incomplete and it's in conflict. Uh, in Agile, all stakeholders have to be involved in the collaboration. Uh, and uh, it is a different perspective. Now, it's easy that the QMS uh, will take over uh, and be heavier on the weight and that Agile will be less important. It's very easy that that will happen. Now, we, you're coming here to listen about Agile and you believe in Agile, I assume, and you don't want this to happen. Um, so what can we do about it? Uh, just before that, I also want to say, uh, no, I think I covered that, I skip it. Now, what can we do to mitigate? Well, if we don't mitigate, it could be like this. Um, in my company, I've done an action research together with my people, action, my staff. Action research is a method, a collaborative approach to do it. You do it together with the team, you research. You plan, you act, you observe what happens, and you reflect on it, and you continue. Uh, it's much older than Agile. First, I think it has its root in the 20s, 1920s or something like that. It can be combined basically with any paradigm, uh, but it's fitting very, very well into Agile. Uh, we've used a collaborative audit. Uh, we have had the auditor, uh, and I was the auditor of, internal auditor of some of these first iteration, but then others have taken over. Uh, what we do is we jointly find NCs. Uh, the auditor ensures that we cover all areas, but we jointly agree on what's NCs. We encourage uh, NCs. We use yellow notes. We, uh, we do it, and we do it in the retrospective meeting of a Scrum, of a Scrum retrospective meeting. Um, we agree on the root cause, and we agree on, correct, on corrective and preventive actions in the retrospect meeting. Uh, we you, we've done it very light. We let the Oh, the one who is assigned as auditor be a secretary and ensure that the wording and the reference to clauses and all of that are handled the right way so the team does not have to be too involved in that and can look at the creative process more. We also encourage identification of nonconformities during the sprint. Uh, the one who is assigned as auditor may sit in on a few sprints, but the members, whether the auditor is in or not, uh, can come up with NCs when they do. We have what we call a hit and misses list. Also positive things we did, which was not new things we interact, we would make up, we can change this, we can do it during the process, during the sprint. And if we miss something, if something goes wrong, we identify at an NC immediately, we can, may take corrective actions there. We still consider it an NC later in the retrospective. Yes, okay. Um, before the retrospective, this is not specific for this, we also prepare all kinds of statistics. Uh, we have the... Uh, uh, the auditor and the scrum master jointly ensure that that is in place so that we have statistics about schedule variance and, and other things like that. We, we, we have a lot of bug statistics and other things. We'll, we'll have that also and discuss it and we look for improvements for that. Um, we have used, there is something on the internet. I, I, have a, a, I have a list with references for whatever I've got the stuff from. Uh, you can get that list if you send me an email, I'll send it to you. But the, there is a, on the internet, you can find an inofficial Scrum checklist. We use that one together with a checklist we have developed ourselves, which covers most of the ISO aspect of it. We try strongly to avoid, avoid uh, letting ISO come from outside and tell people what to do, but we let the team try to see that they belong to a bigger picture. We strongly avoid a high-handed approach to it. We strongly avoid fault finding. Um, and we let the team fully buy in to that it is an NC. Before we did this, it was very common that the auditors were quite high-handed. And the people felt very insulted by the NCs, which were, and they didn't agree with it. Now, today, we have a much better buy-in. Um, what's happening here? No? 
The audits have got lighter, they're more meaningful, and they are definitely more value. Um, the auditor also don't need to know much less. There was a problem earlier that the auditor, didn't, auditor did not understand the customer, did not understand the specific technology, and so sometimes that was a problem. We find that that's much less of a problem now than it was earlier. Uh, there's, less, there's no focus on fault finding. Uh, it supports continuous improvement much better. Um, it mitigates lip service to process and to quality objective also, because everything is in the open. There's much more transparency. And the data we have, we have done this, we started with one scrum team, which has done four sprints in a row. We started with a baseline, and then we have done changes to it. Now they've done a fifth one. They just did a fifth one. I just dropped in. I didn't see the fifth one. It wasn't part of my study, but they did the fifth one last Monday. That was a fifth retrospective of a fifth sprint. And they did this, it has become the natural thing of how to do things. Uh, we're spreading it to other teams now. Uh, we have already started with that, but it's not taken root in the whole company yet, but it's yet to come. Um, and we have, sh we have been able to see that this has given uh, more effect than what we saw earlier when we introduced Scrum in the company. This team has performed better because they have Put their, they have really done. Earlier thing, NCs came so late, so the corrective action often happened long after. Now corrective action is happening much earlier, and there is a visible effect in, in various metrics. Yeah, here is, I just took a photo from the last retrospective meeting in my office, and the, in the video conferencing system, you see the uh, statistics in the background. Uh, but the team is sitting here. Uh, you can't see the whiteboard where they have the yellow notes in the background, but this was the last one, and it worked. I just dropped in and saw it was working very well. Some easy mitigation, mitigation strategies uh, of avoiding the conflicts, um, and some of these are taken from a few papers which I have in my reference. I've learned some from others. Some we have learned ourselves. Uh, to avoid documentation, you can take a photo of the Scrum board every day and just put it in a directory somewhere, and you have it documented. That's an easy way to document. Uh, you can uh, record videos when you speak to customers uh, over Skype or over video conferencing. You can record it and store it if you need to. Uh, some calls may not be important to store. We find we're not looking that much at them, but to satisfy the ISO, we can do it also. So uh, You can define, there is a conflict with ISO when it comes to requirements. User story, the auditor generally, audit generally don't accept user stories as requirements. But you can use user stories together with acceptance criteria, and that seems to be acceptable to the auditors I've spoken to. Um, you can, what we do, we have an Excel sheet, which is a live sheet, which we put anything which is happening during the sprints in. Uh, we put the hits and misses. We also make the live thing, the changes which happen. If we have a feedback over video with customer, and customer suggests something, we just put it there and ensure that it's documented. We keep it as a live document. We check it in at the end in the document system. We don't keep check it in on a daily basis. Uh, it's been quite accepted by the auditor also that we do that. Uh, we use demos and actively request feedback and changes from client. That's nothing new with that. Um, we do injection analysis on the spot when we find NCs, even if it is in the, uh, during the sprint. Um, and we calculate metrics continuously. Um, yes, um, I think I covered the rest. There are some cases with RFPs and with certain things where you're forced to follow a process. Uh, what we have done a few times is that we have used Agile in the middle. We're forced to do certain requirement and high-level design in the beginning. Uh, we're forced to do system testing at the end. So what we do is we do as much Agile as we can and put it in an envelope of a more traditional uh, Process, um, it's not ideal, but sometimes you have to. It's part of the business deal, you have to. What's harder, actually, is to get alignment when it comes to the philosophies, because external auditors, customers, and other stakeholders may not understand the paradigms of Agile. Um, it's, this is a tough one. I can't say I have a solution. I think it's the only way, I think, is that to accept that no paradigm is a complete picture. Uh, no paradigm is uh, correct. If you, we think of the social constructivism, reality, we don't know the true reality. We just use our senses to understand. And if we use different paradigms, maybe we can triangulate and see them from different perspectives and accept that reality is messy. 
Uh, we're not ready yet. Uh, we're working on it. We're getting better and better. We're not ready with the journey. Agile is, is, means move. It means that you're adjusting. But we're adjusting in a, sometimes in a hostile environment. The other paradigms are there. It's sometimes hostile. Um, yeah. Uh, I think agile is not what you do. It's what you are. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, there is a TED show. Uh, I don't remember her name, Amy something. She says, like, you do it till, you fake it till you become it. She's talking about postures, how you stand, uh, that when you do things, you become like that. And I think Agile is a lot of that. That's what we have done in this action research. We have done it. We were not ready. We try it out. We do it. When we see it works, we continue doing it until it becomes part of our culture. I think our Agile journey has been that altogether. It's not that we were fully, philosophically Agile from the beginning. We started doing it. And more and more, we realized this is the right way to do it. And our customers get happier. Uh, so. Uh, to conclude, I would like to ask, ask us all some questions that we should think about what is our underlying paradigm, what values do we, have, do we want to have, which methods best support these values, what practices are required to do these methods, and which tools require to follow them. Uh, I think we have to ask these questions uh, when we work. And we have to decide, are we agile, or which one is the most important one? Uh, I'm sure you can't read all this. Uh, I can send this to you. This is actually, I had more sources than this, but I had to squeeze them in somehow. Um, it's part of a number of papers. One paper, uh, which me and a professor at Blekinge Technical University in Sweden will present in, hopefully present in London in May. Um, some of these sources. Uh, so, any questions? We had uh, customers who said that some of the big companies, they demanded that we should be ISO certified. Uh, as you saw in the uh, comic, it's like it doesn't say what's inside. It just says you're ISO certified. Uh, that was a requirement from the beginning. I do find ISO helpful for one thing, and that is to ensure that you do what you say. I find the problem is with some aspect of the standard but that you are con continuously, sometimes it is like you're going to have an external audit. It forces you to put your documents and other things in order. I do find that to some extent helpful, but sometimes the actual actions you do are not the right one. You can use it as an effective management tool. Uh, I think Toyota throughout ISO uh, at the end, I don't know if they are, I think they are not ISO certified any longer. Uh, because they thought the lean paradigm was more important than ISO, but they still continue to do internal audits. But they, they thought the standard was not consistent with their lean values. Uh, I would, at some stage, potentially consider that if we had the organization where we could do it ourselves and our customers would accept that. I'm not saying ISO is bad. I'm saying there is a conflict. And I think it's, it is a choice you, had, you do. At the stage we are, I think we draw value from both the Agile and from the ISO. But there is a conflict. We struggle with it. Just showing you the, uh, the 7.2.2, it says uh, the review of requirements shall be conducted prior to the organization's commitment to support, to supply a product to the customer. 
That's what ISO says. No, they say you have to review the requirements before you commit. I do agree with you, but when you're ISO certified, you have an external auditor which comes to, we are a TIC IT, we have two times a year he comes. He may interpret it that it has to be done this way, and he may argue, he may argue with us. Right. We have, to a large extent, got our auditor to buy into this, but it, I tell you it wasn't easy. I know, I'm not saying yeah. it's easy, it's a way yeah. to, to tell the In the internal audit, I mean, in my experience, this is possible to do quite easily. When it comes to the external auditor, you're getting an external auditor. He's coming there for one day, and he's going through a lot of projects. He doesn't look at your definition. He looks at the standard. And he looks at that. And then he's, he may look into what you said, and then he said, like, well, I disagree with that. And then he gives you an NC, and you have to motivate how you're going to close it. Uh, I am a little cynical about that side of ISO, because I, it's the audit I'm concerned about. It's not, I agree with you. But the audit process is concerning there. We, we have some funds in the company that are ISO right. 9000 right. certified. Right. Others here that might be a three. Right. So I understand what you're saying. We have audits as well. And that the difficult thing is to make sure that the auditor does understand what we're doing. Right. In the end, okay, ISO just put one thing in for that concern by the end of the by the way, is that you do what you say, what you yeah. have documented as a process. Whether you have garbage in and therefore garbage out, nobody cares. That's, yeah. that's
there are aspects of ISO also which tells management is, is controlling, responsible for, there is a conflict with self-management team, managed team and ISO. Of course not, but, but the auditor may not agree with that interpretation. I, grew, I do agree with what you're saying. Right. Oh, when they go and audit a product, they go one in very, very deep. Right. Oh, yeah. That's exactly how, that's how they audit. They audit that way. Uh, I think we have managed to mitigate this to a very large extent with the methods I suggested. So uh, the, the conflict is there, but there are ways to cross over by agreeing on definitions. But I think to some extent you also have to agree on that there is a philosophical conflict. Conflicts are not necessarily negative. They can be healthy also. Sorry? Yeah. I found this, this uh, discourse with the auditor, with the ISO and Agile, it's very helpful for, for my and my company's maturity, de development of maturity. I think the conflict has been good. Uh, the conf conflict helps me, help us and me to grow. So I'm not saying the conflict is negative. I'm saying there's a conflict. It's helpful to acknowledge it. But uh, as I said, if we look at the world as we triangulate with different paradigms, uh, we would understand things better. But it's not, neither paradigm is complete. Agile is not complete. ISO is not complete but they give different perspectives to reality. But in certain situations, a conflict is a, pro is a problem because one takes precedence. Uh, that's basically what I would say. Any more questions? Okay. Yes. Thank you.